Think about the phone book. The phone book is an effective storage system. It stores the names of all the people and quickly you can navigate to the name based on the index that it has. You can sort it by the first name and you can quickly get the phone number. Similarly, database is also a storage system. It stores the records that we give it and then it gives it back to us as we seek for it. So now, as an application developer, uh, it's very important for us to know how these database systems work. What are they optimized for? What are your use cases that you want to use these storage systems for? And if we have some rough idea what's going on under the hood of some of these systems, then we can actually tune it properly. We can use the right tools for our use cases. So that's the key takeaway from this chapter. We'll get a high level overview of various types of storage systems. Uh, what do they do under the hood? What kind of data structures they use? How to go about potentially picking the right one and in what situation? So even with NoSQL, um, there's 100 plus solutions. So if you were to categorize uh, these into two different broad categories of data stores, it's OLTP and OLAP. So OLAP and OLTP. So OLTP stands for Online Transaction Processing, where these database systems are designed to serve for low latency use cases. And OLAP is for um, heavy data crunching analytical processing systems, right? So typically MySQL, Oracle, and other NoSQL stores are used for OLTP. Uh, whereas for OLAP, uh, Hadoop-based, HBase, Hive, Spark, and other systems are used. Um, also, various column-oriented stores are used to enable for quicker query, faster scanning of some of those records, eventually also using materialized views so that uh, it's, the data is pre-computed and stored. Um, there are some flexibility differences between OLTP and OLAP, like once you optimize and tune your OLAP servers, then uh, systems, then you can actually, for a fixed set of queries, you can get data quickly. Uh, but for OLTP, there's a lot of flexibility. You can write your query and it'll return you the data the way you write it. Um, so let's get into the details of this, right? We talked briefly about row-based versus column-based, right? Uh, typically, OLTP uh, is a row-based system store where it stores the entire um, set of related entities uh, together. Um, like, for example, if you have an order, it could be the ID of the order, the name, the city where the order was placed, the country, and the order number. So all of that data is stored together. And typically, what, what happens is when a customer puts in an order, this entry gets created. But if that's a use case for end user facing OLTP system. Similarly, a use case for, for uh, not an end user system is a column store, where let's say you want to find out um, all the orders placed in a city, right? Uh, and so all you need is two things, order IDs and city, where a certain key exists. You don't need all the names. You don't need the country. You don't need order numbers, right? You All you need is all the orders placed, right? So it's very easy to just key, key it off of the ID and, and the city. So those are analytical queries. So if you think about this, the user using the row-based system or end user is very different. It's the end user, the customer. Uh, column stores or OLAP systems are used primarily by analytics folks or internal to the company. The read-write uh, mechanism is also very different. Uh, in the read, typical use case for row stores is megabytes at most gigabytes, but here it could be potentially gigabytes to terabytes to petabytes for column store analytical queries. So the use cases for read is different. The use case for the writes are different, right? Uh, there's random access uh, for uh, writes for row store use cases typically like or placing an order, you know, um, uh, sending some money, etc. They all have very different use cases and requirements. Um, so you'd want to use the right one, right? Um, there's also the way this data is stored and optimized is also very different. So which, which of these two categories you want is the first step. Is it an OLAP or OLTP? Once you get to that, then you can actually zoom in and narrow in on like, hey, which are the systems or software vendors out there that provide these services to me? And typically for, for an OLAP system, there is a, a set of uh, ETL or extract transform load where there's various systems. Uh, if you see on the left, these are all uh, OLTP potential uh, facing systems, RDBMS, SQL Server, and there are some 
backend stores generating flat files and then there is a staged transform on a periodic basis all that data is taken from OLTP systems and converted into uh, a query optimized data warehouse which is which heavily uses column stores and optimizes based on various indexes that, that are optimized for uh, the backend query processing. So there's periodic data dumps, but there's also streaming ways in which the data warehouse can be filled. And the typical uh, star schema or a snowflake schema for uh, the data warehouse looks like this. There is a very uh, dense fact table and there's very shallow uh, dimension tables. and you can actually just go through the fact table and get most of your data uh, joining very briefly with some of these dimension tables. So understanding Snowflake and Star Schema, especially for column stores and analytical stores, is a very important concept as well. On top of this whole entire how do you actually populate the data warehouse or the OL, OLAP system. Now let's get into like what is the database index, which is a very important concept, right? Typically you can think of index as a derived entity, which is from the primary data, you build a secondary data store or data structure, which allows you to quickly retrieve information. Like in the phone book, it's sorted. Remember, it's sorted by the name, ideally, or the first name or the last name, and you stick to that sorting mechanism. Once you have stored it in the best way, you have a data structure to actually seek that data very quickly. So based on your optimizations, you might want to optimize for reads, you might want to optimize for writes. Typically, the index actually slows down writes based on how it's actually set up. So again, depends on the query, depends on your use case, it will be very different. Um, and there are various things to consider when you think of an index. It's not as simple as the phone book. It starts as simple as the phone book, but think about it. You would have to think about encoding, right? Like what, what values, what uh, would you store and how would you store how would you handle deleting records? Maybe use a concept of tombstone and various other things you'd have to think about, like how do you remove things? In the phone, you can just X out, right? But what happens in the database? How does that in how does it handle and propagate those changes to the index? How does crash recovery happen? If it's in memory, is in disk, is it like partially in memory, partially in disk? Is there some sort of a write-ahead log? Like how, how does it actually recover and make sure that when there is a power failure or database outage or like a colo outage, how does it recover? How does it uh, deal with uh, you know partially written records? What if you could only write the first half and not the second half? You know, there's things that you can use on techniques with checksums and whole host of other ways. How do you ensure there's concurrency control? Like not not two different threads are writing to it on the same record and overwriting each other. And what if you could take out more money from an ATM because there's concurrency issues, right? So database and database index have a lot of things that they need to take care of. It's not as trivial as the phone book, even there are use cases that it doesn't handle, like range queries. How do you, how would you query for something like, hey, give me all the cities that fall between this latitude and this longitude, right? Then you'd have to figure out like what kind of an index you would form. There's R trees is another way of solving that, but that's a separate topic. So index is basically a data structure derived from primary data, allows you to quickly seek the data that you're looking for. And there are two main families of uh, storage engines that's something that's also covered in this chapter uh, the lsm log structured uh, trees or ss tables sorted um, tables sorted string tables basically it's uh, key value pairs are sorted by the keys and page oriented which is like uh, optimizes for the hardware b trees is is commonly used heavily by all relational databases uh, um, but Log structure is getting more and more popularity with all of the recent ones uh, that optimizes heavily for the writes uh, currently. Both of these are solutions to disk limitations on access. Like think about it. If you want to access petabytes of data, gigabytes of data for queries, you want to do it in an efficient way. You want to do it in the fast optimized way. So LSM trees or SS tables, sorted string tables, um, are in memory, it uses in memory, but also has ways in which it can write things to the disk when the memory is actually uh, at the limit. And it allows for doing that with using this thing called compaction. It allows, uh, it's a background process which um, which merges these keys together. So it can, you can only have to keep the most relevant last keys that were written. There are various ways and mechanisms that it uses uh, in the implementation, various 
um, um, vendors like Lucene and others, uh, they, they use some, some sort of SS tables for the in-memory lookup, but they also use various other mechanisms like Bloom filters and others to check whether these keys even exist, right? So SS tables, uh, LSM trees are basically log oriented. They sort based on the keys and then they use memory and disk to do this. Um, and there's a very, and they, they use disk in a way that it actually optimizes for writes in a pretty big way, right? Um, so it starts with memory, then it goes to the compacted version to the disk if it doesn't find it, and then uh, uses various other mechanisms like bloom filters and others to check whether those keys exist so that it avoids thrashing. B trees is the even more, uh, it, you could think about B trees as the most widely used. Um, and uh, the beauty of it is that there's only one key and it's placed only at one place in B tree implementation. Um, and so, and it's optimized with a different philosophy. It does have keys that are sorted um, by the keys. Uh, it has everything stored by keys, uh, key value pairs being sorted by the keys as, as with the LSM trees. Um, but the fundamental design is more factored towards hardware optimizations uh, and how it's actually stored on the disk. So it, it has four kilobytes of pages with various branching factors, which is how it references the uh, leaf nodes. Um, and if you think about this, right, four level tree with four KB page size with 256, uh, uh, with 500 branching factor can store about 256 terabytes. So this, this looks simple, but even with smaller uh, branching factor, you can actually store a lot of data. Um, and this is that example. Again, we, um, the difference is that it's uh, optimized heavily for reads um, and um, it's heavily used in various RDBMSs uh, that exist today. You can also optimize it as you see here, the, the child nodes are actually, uh, siblings are connected. So you can actually even optimize it for sequential reads in some ways. You don't have to keep going back to the leaf nodes and root nodes for it as well. So various modifications exist for B tree implementation. So again, we went through two different things, B trees and LSM trees. Those are the two broad categories of storage engines that storage engines use. And they, some of them, most of them actually use a combination of both of them. There's also various uh, in-memory databases. Most of what we discussed so far is uh, disk-based and memory-based. Um, and there's a lot, lot about indexes. We talked about various things about encoding and about concurrency and a whole host of other things. But there are various other techniques that indexes uh, have, like clustered index, like what if we could store the rows in the index itself? You don't probably need to reference it. Secondary index, uh, what if you want to optimize for various joints that are queries that you already have. Um, covering index is a hybrid, right? Like few columns are included. Multi-column index where you probably might have first name concatenated fields, first name, last name together. And then you can still key off of that concatenated key. So there's multi-column keys index. It's a huge topic on information retrieval will foot, will foot full stack search and uh, how indexes deal with spelling mistakes, like with edit distances, grammar, synonyms, uh, linguistic nuances, and various other things. It's a huge topic in itself, but this chapter gives us a really good vocabulary of all the complexities and gives us a true appreciation of what all might be going on under the hood, right? And the various stores uh, that also deal with uh, volatile memory that's, that's gaining traction, but also in-memory stores that are also gaining a lot of traction. So that's it. I, I really hope that this chapter uh, helps helped you all to also get some overview of this. It helped me immensely as an application developer to understand like what, what choices are out there, what should I be using, what should I be looking at for tuning, and gives us a good vocabulary of what's probably going on under the hood in terms of the schema, in terms of implementation, what kind of data structure it uses, and you know where to go about it, right? So that was a really good chapter for me. I hope you enjoyed it. See you in the next chapter.